here we are I'm back once again hey there guys reckoning here and welcome back to Cottable show Joe it has been quite a while since I've recorded anything for this I'm thinking it's been around a year and a half actually since I recorded the end of Emmy's arc and the original Rin arc and sure I could have just re-uploaded the original Rin arc but I figured that quite a few things happened in between and I feel that I could redo it and do it even better this time around. Will I actually be able to do that? Who knows? But we shall see. It's one other thing that I'd want to get done at some point with this just because I could probably do that better as well but that'll wait for a later date. Right now we're going to start Rin's arc again. So for those of you who wanted my reading, it returns. A light breeze causes the naked branches overhead to rattle like wooden wind chimes. This is a popular retreat for couples in the summer. The deciduous trees provide a beautiful green canopy, far out of sight of teachers and fellow students. But now, in late winter, it feels like I'm standing under a pile of kindling. I breathe into my cupped hands and rub them together furiously to prevent them from numbing in this cold. Just how long am I expected to wait out here anyway? I'm sure the note said 4 p.m. Ah, yes. The note. Slipped between the pages of my math book while I wasn't looking. As far as cliches go, I'm more of a fan of the letter in the locker, but at least this way shows a bit of initiative. As I ponder the meaning of the note, the snowfall gradually thickens. The snowflakes silently falling from the painted white sky are the only sign of time passing in this stagnant world. Their slow descent upon the frozen forest makes it seem like time is slowed to a crawl. The rustling of dry snow underfoot startles me, interrupting the quiet mood. Someone is approaching me from behind. Hassel? You came? A hesitating, barely audible question. However, I recognize the owner of that dainty voice instantly. I feel my heart skip a beat. It's a voice I've listened to hundreds of times, but never is more than an eavesdropper to a conversation. I turn to face this voice, the voice of my dreams, and my heart begins to race. Yowanako? I got a note telling me to wait here. It was yours? Damn it. I spent all afternoon trying to come up with a good line, and that was the result. Pathetic. Um, yes. I asked a friend to give you that note. I'm so glad you got it. A shy, joyous smile that makes me so tense I couldn't move a single muscle, even if I tried. My heart is pounding now, as if it were trying to burst out from my chest and claim this girl for itself. So, uh, here we are, out in the cold. Once again, the wind stirs up the branches. The cacophonous noise is music to my ears. Iwanako flinches ever so slightly against the gust of wind. As it passes, she writes herself, as if supported by some new confidence. Her eyes lock with mine, and she lazily twirls her long, dark hair around her finger. All the while, the anxious beating of my heart grows louder. My throat is tight. I doubt I could even force a word out if I tried. You see... I wanted to know if you'd go out with me. I stand there, motionless, safe from my pounding heart. I want to say something in reply, but my fo vocal cords feel like they've been stretched beyond the breaking point. A sow? I reach up to try to massage my throat, but this only sends spi spikes of blinding pain along my arms. A sow? My whole body freezes, save for my eyes, which shoot open in terror. Hissau! The beating in my chest suddenly stops, and I go weak at the knees. The world around me, the canopy of bare branches, the dull winter sky, Iwanaka running towards me, all these fade to black. The last things I remember before slipping away are the sounds of Iwanaka screaming for help and the incessant clatter of the branches above. So, if you couldn't pick up from that first scene, I don't quite remember Iwanako's voice. 
I, I kind of remember most of them, but since hers is only like five minutes throughout, throughout the entire series, I don't really remember it. Don't know whose it was based on. But I mean, there's a couple few that I still know quite well. And I, I'm sure you know which ones they are. And if you're a frequent watcher of my streams, then you'll probably know that as well. Though that really only clues you into one of them. Still, there's one or two that you really can't forget. Ever. So, no need to worry about that. So yes, I plan to do this a little bit better, maybe not talk as fast, things like that, maybe not trip over my words so often, and hey, words, it's been four months since my heart attack. In that whole time, I can probably count the times I left this hospital room unsupervised on one hand. Four months is a pretty long time when you're left alone with your thoughts, so I've had plenty of time to come to terms with my situation. Arrhythmia. Strange word. A foreign, alien one. One that you don't want to be in the same room with. A rare condition. It causes the heart to act erratically and occasionally beat way too fast. It can be fatal. Apparently, I've had it for a long time. They said it was a miracle that I was able to go on so long without anything happening. Is that really a miracle? I guess it was supposed to make me feel better, or appreciative of my life. It really didn't do anything to cheer me up. My parents, I think, were hit harder by the news than I was. They practically had two hemorrhages apiece. I had already had a full day by then to digest everything. To them, it was all fresh. They were even willing to sell our house in order to pay for a cure. Of course, there isn't a cure. Because of the late discovery of this condition, I've had to stay at the hospital to recuperate from the treatments. When I was first admitted, it felt as if I was missed. For about a week, our room in the ward was full of flowers, balloons, and cards. But, the visitors soon dwindled and all the get well gifts began tripling, trickling down to nothing shortly after. I realized that the only reason I'd gotten so many cards and flowers was because sending me their sympathy had been turned into a class project. Maybe some people were generally concerned, but I doubt it. Even in the beginning, I barely had visitors. By the end of the first month, only my parents came by on a regular basis. Ibanako was the last to stop visiting. After six weeks, I never saw her again. Never had that much to talk about when she visited, anyway. We didn't touch the subject that was between us on that snowy day ever again. The hospital? It's not really a place I'd like to live in. The doctors and nurses feel so impersonal and faceless. I guess it's because they're in a hurry and they have a million other patients waiting for them. But it makes me feel uncomfortable. For the first month or so, I asked the head cardiologist every time I saw him for a rough estimate of when I'd be able to leave never answered anything in a straightforward way, but he told me to wait and see if the treatment and surgeries worked. So, I idly observed, observed the scar that those surgeries left on my chest slowly changed its appearance over time, thinking of it as some kind of an omen. I still asked the head cardiologist about leaving, but my expectations are low enough now that I'm not dis disappointed anymore when I don't get a reply. The way he shuffles around the answer shows that there's at least some hope. At some point, I stopped watching TV. I don't know why, I just did. Maybe it was the wrong kind of escapism for my situation. I started reading instead. There was a small library at the hospital, although it was more like a storeroom for books. I began working my way through it, one small stack at a time. After consuming them, I would go back for more. I found that I liked reading, and I think I even became a little addicted. I started feeling naked without a book in my hands. But I loved the stories. That was what my life was like. The days became increasingly harder to distinguish from one another. Or from each other, actually. Differing only by the book I was reading and the weather outside. It felt like time blurred in some gooey, kind of gooey mass I was trapped inside, instead of moving within. A week could go by without me really noticing it. Sometimes, I'd pause in realization that I didn't know what the day of the week it was. But other times, all the things that surrounded me would painfully crash into my consciousness through the barrier of nonchalance I'd set up for myself. The pages of my book would start to feel sharp and burning hot, and the heaviness in my chest would become so hard to bear that I had to put the book aside and just lay down for a while, looking at the ceiling as if I was going to cry. But that happened only rarely, and I couldn't even cry. 
Today, the doctor comes in and gives me a smile. He seems excited, but not very. It's like he's trying to make an effort to be happy on my behalf. My parents are here. It's been a few days since I last seen them. Both of them are even sort of dressed up. Is this supposed to be some kind of special occasion? It's not a party. There's this ritual the head cardiologist has. He takes his time, sorting his papers, and setting them aside as if to make a point of the pointlessness of what he just did. Then he casually sits down on the edge of the bed, net, at the edge of the bed next to mine. He looks me in the eyes for a moment. Hello, Hassel. How are you today? I don't answer him, but I smile a little back at him. I believe that you can go home. Your heart is stronger now, and with some precautions, you should be fine. We have all your medication sorted out. I'll give your father the prescription. The doctor hands a sheet of paper to my dad, whose expression turns wooden as he reads it quickly. So many. I take it from his hand and take a look at myself, feeling numb. How am I supposed to react to this? There's, there's diarrhea, cardiac arrest, nausea, five milligrams a day, extremities, asthma, clinical depression. There's a lot of things here. The absurdly long list of medications staring back at me from the paper seems insurmountable. They all blend together in a sea of letters. This is insane. Side effects, adverse effects, contradictions and dosages listed listed line after line with cold precision. I try to read them, but it's so futile. Or futile, depending on how you pronounce it. I can't understand, understand any of it. Attempting to only makes me feel sicker. All of this, for the rest of my life, every day? I'm afraid that it's the best we can do at this point. Oh wait, I did his voice wrong. Whatever. How, however, new medications are always being developed, so I wouldn't be surprised to see that list fade over the years. Years. What kind of confidence booster is that? I'd have felt better if he hadn't said anything at all. Also, I've spoken with your parents, and we believe that it would be best if you don't return to your old school. What? Please, calm down, Hassel. Listen to what the doctor has to say. Calm down? The way he says it tells me he knew full well that I wouldn't like it. Am I going to be homeschooled? Whatever, whatever of my concern shows, it's ignored. We all understand that your edu education is paramount. However, I don't think that it's wise for you to be without supervision. At least not until we're sure that your medication is suitable. So, I've spoken to your parents about a transfer. It's a school called Yamaku Academy that specializes in dealing with disabled students. Disabled? What? Am I... It has a 24-hour nursing staff, and it's only a few minutes from a highly regarded general hospital. The majority of students live on the campus. Think of it as a boarding school of sorts. It's designed to give students a degree of independence, while keeping help nearby. Independence? It's a school for disabled kids. Don't try to disguise that fact. If it really was that free, there wouldn't be a 24-hour nursing staff, and you wouldn't make a hospital being nearby a selling point. Of course, that's only if you want to go, but your mother and I aren't really able to homeschool you. We went out there and had a look a couple of weeks back. I think you'd like it. Looks like I really don't have a choice. Compared to other heart problems, people with your condition usually tend to live long lives. You'll need a job one day that's a good opportunity to continue your education. This is an opportunity? Don't call it an opportunity. Don't call it a goddamned opportunity. Well, you should be excited at the chance to go back to school. I remember you wanted to return to school. And while it's not the same one, a special school, that's an insult. That's what I want to say. It's a step down. It's not what you think. All the students there are pretty active in their own sort of way. It's geared towards students that can still get around and learn, but just need a little help, in one way or another. Your father's right. And many of the graduates of the school have gone on to do amazing things. A person doesn't have to be held back by the disability. One of my colleagues in another hospital is a graduate. I don't care. A person doesn't have to be held back by the disability. That's what a disability is. I really hate that something so important was decided for me. But what can I do about it? A normal life is out of the question now. It's funny. I'd always thought my life was actually kind of boring. But now I miss it. I want to protest. I want to blame this lack of reaction on shock or fatigue. I could easily yell out something now. Something about how I can go back to school anyway. But no. I don't say anything. The fact is that I know now it's futile. I look around the room, feeling very tired of all this. The hospital, doctors, my condition, everything. I don't see anything that would make me feel any different. 
There really isn't a choice. I know this, but the thought of going to a disabled school. What are those even like? As much as I try to put a positive spin on this, it's very difficult. But let me try. A clean slate isn't a bad thing. That is all I can think of to get me through this. At least I still have something. Even if it's a special school, it's something. It's a fresh start, my life isn't over. It would be a mistake just to resign myself to thinking that. At the very least, I try to see what my new life will look like. Act 1. Life Expectancy. And we're only 16 minutes in. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. The gate looked far too pompous for what it was. In fact, gates in, sen in general seem to do that, but this one especially so. Red bricks, black wrought iron, and gray plaster assembled into a hole that didn't feel welcoming at all. I wondered if it looked like what a gate for a school should look like, but couldn't really decide. Probably no. Of course, I didn't want to get stuck on thinking about the gate for too long, so I entered through it with a, with a brisk pace that felt surprisingly good. Moving forward feels good. So I walk toward the main building of Yamaku Academy with this brisk pace. I'm alone, as my parents are taking my stuff to the dorms, and there's supposed to be someone waiting for me. The grounds are incredibly lush, filled with green. It doesn't feel like the kind of grounds a school would have. More like a park, with a clean walkway going past trees and the smell of fresh-cut grass and all the other park-like things. Words like clean and hygienic pop into my mind. It makes me shudder. I shake them off. Stay open-minded now. It's your new life. You have to take it as it comes. That's what I told myself. A few big buildings loom behind the leafy canopies, too big and too many for just a school. Everything seems off. It's different from what I thought about, from what I thought I knew about schools. It's an uncanny valley. Even though I was told this is my new school, in the back of my head it doesn't feel like one. I wonder if the feeling is real or caused by my expectations of a school for the disabled. Speaking of that, I don't see anyone else here. It's kind of eerie. It makes me wish there was someone. Up somebody here so I can anchor myself to something tangible instead of having this feeling that I step into another dimension. The trees hum with the wind and the green, green hues flashing all around me catch my attention. It makes me think about hosp hospitals again, how they say that the operating rooms are painted green because green is a common color. So why am I feeling so anxious despite all this greenery? Only after I stand in front of the haughty main building I surprise myself by realizing why the gate bothered me. It was the last chance I had to turn back even if I had no life to, I could return to. But still, after entering, there was absolutely no way I could go back anymore. Feeling nervous and with this realization set in my head, I open the front door. A tall man with bad posture notices me as I enter. We're the only people in the, in the lobby, so it's only logical. You must be... N na... Nikki? Nakai. So you are. Excellent. I'm your homeroom and science teacher. My name is Muto. Welcome. We exchange a handshake that is neither firm nor sloppy, and he looks at his watch. The head nurse asks you for a brief check-in visit, but there's no time for that now. Oh, should I go later? Yes, afternoon is probably fine. We should get going and introduce you to, rest, to the rest of the class. They're probably wait they're waiting. So they're waiting already. Waiting for me? I don't really like being the center of attention, but I guess it's inevitable in a situation like this. Somehow, not knowing what is waiting for me makes me feel really nervous. Thinking of this, I almost miss what the teacher's saying. Do you want to introduce yourself to the class? Now, I'm, I seem to recall that this choice doesn't really matter, so we'll just go with the gal, of course. Yeah, sure, I mean, isn't that normal? Of course, but not everyone likes to be at the center of attention. I'm probably one of those people, but I guess I should be the one to give the first impression of myself. Right, but it's no problem. Let's go, then. My heart is pounding in my chest, and it keeps me thinking about my condition as I follow the teacher up the stairs. The third door down the third floor corridor is mac marked, macked, marked as the classroom for class 3-3. Muto opens the door and enters. Good morning, everyone. Sorry I'm late again. I hesitate for a split second at the door, freezing on the spot. Ha, ah, get a grip. This is a big step, I know that. But there isn't any point to worrying so much about it, at least not this soon. I follow the teacher into the classroom and look around, partially so I won't have to meet the curious gazes of my new classmates. 
It's pretty spacious. The ceiling is unusually high, and there's lots of space left over and in, in between the desks. An entire wall taken up by blackboards and the high, old-fashioned windows only make it seem larger. The students' desks are just standard wooden desks with a shelf underneath for books and wooden chairs with metal frames. Simple and efficient. I stop walking in front of the classroom and face the other students. They all look normal, like students in any other school. But then, why would they be here? They're probably like me and have something wrong with them, only it's not just the immediate obvious. Then, I notice that one of the girls seems to be missing the thumb of her right hand. It's a little jarring. Despite the natural tendency to listen when someone's talking about you, I tune out the teacher's speech halfway through while he introduces me to the class. I notice a flash of dark hair and see that someone is looking at me. A girl with really long, straight hair that is pretty eye-catching. As she sees me looking back at her, she covers her face with her hands if it will make her invisible. There's one boy with a cane leaning against the lockers at the right of the class. It's weird seeing someone so young with a cane. Another girl seems to be making some weird hand motions. Sign language? She peers at me over the rims of her glasses, then goes back to whatever she's doing. She's kind of cute. So is the cheery-looking girl with pink hair sitting next to her. She's really hard to miss. I don't know how I didn't notice her the moment I walked in. Please welcome our newest classmate. He claps his hands and so does everyone else, except one girl in the front row who has only one hand. I cringe a little, but hide it by bowing in thanks for this applause that not as I did not deserve. A collective silence tells me I should open my mouth now. So... I'm Hisao Nakai, and after that, my hobbies are reading and soccer. I hope to get along well with everyone, even though I'm a new student. And after that, being so boring. It's exactly like every self-introduction ever. I should say something more, something more exciting. I end up saying nothing, and the teacher picks up from there. Everyone seems to be satisfied even with what little I said, though. A few girls are whispering to each other, throwing glances at me. It could have gone worse. I listen to the teacher as he drones on about getting along while letting my gaze sweep across the classroom. Everyone seems to be listening to him intently, and when he's done, they clap their hands again, which feels like a weird thing to do. The first, first row girl the first row girl claps on this round with one hand against her other wrist that ends in a banded stump. It makes me feel a little bad. We're going to be doing some group work today, so that'll give you a chance to talk with everyone. Is that okay with you? Yeah, it's fine with me. That's good. You can work with Hakamichi. She's the class representative. She can explain anything you might want to know. And who else would you and who else would be able to do that better, right? How could I know? The teacher passes out the day's assignments and announces that we'll be working in groups of three. It hits me that I don't know who Hakamichi is. Slow. The teacher seems to catch my helpless expression. Oh right. Hakamichi's right there. Shizune Hakamichi. As he calls her name, the cute, bubbly-looking girl with bright pink hair and gold eyes waves her hand at me. I take a seat next to her by the window. Hey, I guess you're Hakamichi, right? It's nice to meet you. After a year and a fucking half, it returns. It's gonna take a minute or two to get used to again. What? I'm caught off guard by our laughter. It's nice to meet you, too. But, I'm not Hakamichi. I'm Misha. This is Hakamichi. Shichan! God, that voice! Giggling, Misha points to the girl next to her, the one I saw using sign language before. It looks like she's been staring at me this whole time. She nods once nonchalantly to show that she acknowledges my presence, but only barely. She has short yet carefully neatly brushed hair, a pair of old full shaped glasses balanced on the tip of a dainty nose, and dark blue eyes that seem to alternate every few seconds between analytical and slightly bored. It's nice to meet you. She immediately looks to Misha, who smiles and makes a few quick gestures with her hands. Hakamichi nods and makes a few gestures of her own. I start to wonder if the teacher was messing with me, saying things like, You'll be able to talk to people, and who better to explain things to you? I can see you're a little confused, right? Right? But I understand why you would think I'm a Shichan. Shichan's deaf, so I'm the person who translates things back and forth for her. I'm like an interpreter. She says, nice to meet you. She says, nice to meet you too. Sounds a bit different than last time. I don't know why. You're the new student, aren't you? Well, Shichan, of course he is. If he wasn't, he wouldn't have been standing up there for no reason, right? Right. He seems like a very interesting person, doesn't he? We knew there was going to be a new student, but we didn't know he would be here today. So, sh so soon. He-chan, right? He-chan. Yep, it fits, doesn't it? Did I say it out loud? Just a surprise. I never liked that nickname. I don't really see how. 
It fits! You look just like I imagined. Ah! Yeah, you look just like a Hee-Chan. That doesn't sound like it did before. Well, I won't, won't really have to worry about it. We're not going to have too many conversations with Misha. I wonder why everyone seems to think so. Hakamichi taps her fingers on the desk to get Misha's attention. They gesture back and forth to each other excitedly, their hands a blur. Misha seems a little overwhelmed. Ah, uh, sorry about that. Chi Chen wants you to know that she's the class rep, so if there's anything you need to know, you can feel free to ask her. You like the school so far? We can show you around a little if you haven't had time to walk around and familiarize yourself with it. Misha stumbles with the hard world. World. The hard world. The hard word a bit, making it stick out in an otherwise fluid translation. Thanks, that would be pretty helpful. Yeah, I just kind of came straight to class today. Ha! <laughs> That's no good. You should always try to learn as much as you can about where you're going before you go there. Not just with school either. Always, even if it's a, tr even it's, if it's a trip to the convenience store. Really, she can. Ha ha ha! it. Learn about where you're going. Is it in mother to do that, or just didn't care enough to do so? I didn't look forward to this, even if I committed myself to go along with the half acidly. But anyway. I don't say anything, and Misha signs something and it's in a shrug. What was that? It seems like it was about me. I feel like slumping over my seat. Both of them are smiling, but that shrug hit me unexpectedly deeply. You look down. Are you okay? Don't take it the wrong way, please. I hate it when people are afraid to ask questions. That's how people learn things, by asking. Asking for help is perfectly normal. As much as Dina help. Stop looking like you just failed a test. Wah! God damn it. Uh. Misha's laugh for president. Alright. Ah, and another thing. You don't have to call Shi-Chan something so formal like Hakumichi or class rep all the time. Just call her Shi-Chan. I like how the music stops on that one. Aha! Uh -huh. Oh, okay, maybe that's too casual. Maybe Shizune would be more appropriate. Yep, yep, Shizune is fine. Huh. Okay, that'd be a lot easier for me. I feel a lot more at ease. Both of them seem so friendly, so I feel like an idiot for being so apprehensive earlier. Especially about Shizune, who I assumed would be all business. Well, she still seems like that. Just less so, I guess. Huh? Oh, right, we haven't even touched the assignment. We should start work now. Shichan will get mad. Simon is also kind of long, so we should start now if we want to finish it before the end of class. Wah! That too! Shizune glares at the two of us impatiently. I don't need no sign language to understand that. Okay, okay, I get the message. After class, we can take a walk, the walk around the grounds together. It's a nice day today, okay? God, that voice is different. I don't like that. The assignment is actually very challenging to get through, combining aspects of being both difficult and unnecessarily long. Still, we finish it with we finish it a few minutes earlier than anyone else in the class, despite our late start. Shizune and Misha are really capable. They're quite different, though. The class rep is as calm and professional as she looks, while Misha is a lot more playful and girlish, not to mention a little more easily distracted. To be honest, the two of them did most of the work. I feel guilty about that. The clock tower bells ring, signaling the end of the period. Time for lunch. Without knowing what else to do, I follow Mishu, who's beckoning me into the hallway and down the stairs. We descend even below the lobby where I met Muto, down to the bottom floor. Just like everything else in this school, just like everything in the school, the cafeteria seems too spacious and oddly modern in contrast to the classic exterior. Its big windows open to the courtyard, toward the main gate. It's the cafeteria! Her enthusiastic statement of the obvious makes people around us stare, but Misha doesn't seem to care, so we proceed to the line. There's a rather long list of menu options, which seems great until I realize that many of them are to accommodate students who need special diets. How nice! It almost feels like I'm back at the hospital, eating portions measured with scientific precision to meet the needs of the patients. I pick something at random and follow Shizune to a table, sitting opposite of her. As I nibble indifferently at the food I'd rather not eat, Misha pokes me in the side to get my attention and points to Shizune. I don't understand signs, so the point escapes me. 
Maybe looking at a person who talks to you is proper and polite. Do you want to know something? What? About anything. We're your guide, so you should ask if there's something. I wonder. Well, since we're at right around half an hour, I think, would be a pretty good stopping point for the first episode back in a year and a half. Hopefully, I improve my Misha voice up, up to the amazing levels that it was at before, and things of that nature. But, I mean, shouldn't really need to stress about that, as we're going down Rin's arc and not Shizune's arc, so not a big deal that I get that perfected. But still, it's the Misha voice, and everybody loves the Misha voice, so it's gotta be as good as possible. But, yeah, I think that'll just about do it for this episode, so... If I can remember what the outro was... Like, two years ago. Um... I'm pretty sure it was, I am reckoning, you are the viewer. The viewer. Yeah, I am reckoning, you are the viewer, give me a like or favorite. If you like this video, leave me a comment down below telling me what you liked about the video or didn't like about the video. And I'm pretty sure you could outline a few things you didn't like about it, because there are a few things I messed up. But, um, just any recommendations and any other things you want to say down in the comments, go ahead and do that. Um, share this with your friends if you enjoyed it and think they would enjoy it, and maybe they want to see it, and things like that. Um, I'd say subscribe for more videos like this, but I'm going to continue this anyway until I finish Ren's arc, so. Subscribing wouldn't really affect how fast it comes out. The only thing that governs that is how lazy I am. That has nothing to do with subscribers. So you don't no need to worry about that. But I, I'm going to end the video now and maybe record another one or something. So I, I'm going to do that and the video is going to end. Okay? <laughs>